gunners would break, self-identify for like alcoholism or PTSD, and they obviously weren't flying anymore on gunships, rotator cuff issues, back issues, knee issues. The gunner job itself was actually really hard on the body and it broke a lot of people. People tried to get out of it, but for gunners, it wasn't easy to get out of. We actually used to make jokes about it, like the gunship flew on cancer. <laughs> uh, the cancer rate in the gunship community is actually pretty high because we have like some of the most cancerous substances, no demand on there. They had Air Force quality or some kind of medical people come out and do like an air test while we were doing live fire on the gunship. The amount of lead in the air while we were shooting was so high that they were like, you should be on oxygen literally all the time. And we weren't, and we didn't even with that advice. Towards my last deployment, I felt like death when I woke up. I'd have headaches near constantly, irritability, trouble sleeping. Like it felt like I was dying. It was sold to you. Like they knew how bad it was. They didn't try hiding it. They just didn't care what it was doing to their bodies until it caught up with them. This job is amazing enough to keep doing it until you can't physically anymore is basically what some of the old heads told you. I'm trying to go over the peace sign for like funny years, but instead it looks like I'm trying to use <laughs> Jedi mind tricks on you. <laughs> I was working at Toys R Us as a, a stalker, uh, not stalking in <laughs> Toys R Us, but like, <laughs> but like a shelf stalker. Probably not a good thing to stalk inside Toys R Us with all the children around. Probably not the model employee or the guy that you would expect to end up on gunships because I was just a big stoner. What was the point where you're like, where you were like, I'm done with Toys R Us because I feel like you just want to get away from me. <laughs> oh. I got fired from Toys R Us. Pretty sure, like, it factored in the fact that I showed up every day stoned to, like, a kid-friendly establishment. I was, like, a year out of high school. My life's going nowhere fast because I was, like, everyone who graduates high school, they're like, I'll do something in, like, a year and I'll be, like, a young, hot millionaire and whatever. I'm not just going to wake up one day with, like, a, a million-dollar idea. I've got to start, you know, doing something with my life. My uncle, he kind of runs, like, a body shop. One day he came to visit us and he... He kind of pulled me aside and he's like, hey man, what are you like? What are you doing with your life? Look at your dad. He was in the military. Your mom was in the military. They're successful and I'm about to be foreclosed on my house because my body shop's going under because I'm 40 years old and I can't, uh, my body just can't keep up with the amount of work I have to do to keep a roof over my head. I actually hated the military in all aspects of it. Was never going to do it. Swore that I would not follow my parents' footsteps and then that's exactly what I did. My dad's in like 100k plus paying job in like the government my mom was retired and she was working for the civilian sector and she was about to get like her military retirement on top of the 10 years of civilian service so she was about to have two retirements and i looked at them and i'm like wow okay they're successful and they went in the military and i have no direction maybe the military will give me that direction if it worked for my parents is your uncle okay now did he find a way back on his feet um, he's still got his roof over his head, but he's still doing body shop work and he's like lost all of his teeth. He's kind of addicted to painkillers to like get through the day. We're pretty sure he has like lung cancer and just won't go to the doctor because he can't afford it. I had the whole scoop about like the military going in. I was like, it's going to suck. And I knew it was going to suck. I talked to my dad about it and like everyone else I knew. It's going to suck, but you're going to miss it when you're out. And they were right. I do miss it a little bit. When I went into the recruiting office, I, I did my ASVAB and it was high enough to where they're like, basically any job on the list you can want you can get. I put Loadmaster in there. I put in uh, ATC. If you get out and you do air traffic controlling, you can make a lot of money. My mom told me, and this is like the one thing she told me that was wrong. You don't have to pick five jobs. You only have to pick four. I walked in there only with four jobs. And the recruiter was like, you only have four jobs on here. And I'm like, I only need four. And he's like, no, that's Air Force regulation. You need to pick five jobs on your dream sheet. And I looked down the list and nothing really jumped out at me. What's aerial gunner? And he's like, uh, I think you shoot guns out of planes. And I'm like, Oh, well, okay. It's my fifth pick. I'm probably not going to get it. Whoop. Wrote it down in there. And that was my fifth pick. And then like two weeks later, I got a call from the recruiter. And they're like, hey, man, you're going to be psyched. I uh, got this job for you. Guess what it is? And I'm like, I don't know. What is it? And he's like, aerial gunner. And I'm like, okay, so what is that exactly again? He's like, you're going to be a gunner on like HH-60s or the Pavlo or the AC-130. The AC-130 from like Modern Warfare 2? And he's like, yeah, man. And then I got really into it. I started playing Modern Warfare a lot more than I already had been. Kill streak at the top is the, is the gunship. <laughs> Just religiously tried to get the gunship in every game. <laughs> the perfect position for uh, talking about gunships, the fetal position. I was kind of lazy. I didn't do any like the push-ups or like the run before I went to basic training. I didn't just smoke weed, I smoked Marlboro Reds. 
So, so like, I showed up to basic oh training, like, God. super, super out of shape, man. Couldn't do, like, 15 push-ups to save my life. And I showed up to basic training with uh, bands, the little flat sh- skater shoes. They make you go out there and do a mock physical training test. I came in at, like, over 16 and a half minutes or something like that on the run, which is not good. It's, like, 10-something to pass uh, basic training. Came in, like, super unhealthy and shitty. I was like marching like this, my hands swinging together rather than like like doing this. My TI would always like struggle. What the fuck are you doing? Like, (laughs) just do it naturally. Just walk naturally. Walk like a human being, struggle. There's this like big ceremony after you like graduate the aerial gunner course. They take all the people that have graduated on stage. They give you your silver wings. They have like metal pins on the back sides of them. The old tradition was is they punch it in. Those teen needles would go into your chest, earning your wings through blood kind of thing punch them on so hard that they'll never come off they stopped doing it because it was like hazing and there was like a big push in the air force to like not haze people anymore but my dad could do it because my dad's family he punched me so hard that i like walked back three steps on the stage so after we got done with the the, the, the land seer and like the the water seer i went to my first duty station herbert field florida headquarters of air force special operations command and i was psyched I wasn't considered what was like permanent party yet. I hadn't gotten through training to the point where they would consider me like a full-fledged member of the Air Force. I was still on probation kind of kind of thing. That was just a schoolhouse of getting into the books, having to learn like technical data about guns on the aircraft. What's the fire rate? Do you know the cycle of ops? A failure to fire? What are the malfunction steps to do to deal with that? We've actually lost quite a few gunships in like history. We lost Jockey 1-4 in Somalia during the Black Hawk Down incident. We lost uh, Spirit 03 because they got shot down by like a man pad. From the legacy, there's also the lessons that have been learned on gunships. You know, don't fly during the daytime because you're a low, slow flying aircraft flying in a circle. Probably not a good idea to fly during the daytime when also doing that maneuver because then it's like, and they can clearly just line up AAA or a man pad on you and just shoot you down. Not to say that we didn't fly daytime missions, we did, but like, we tried not to until Air Force Brass came down and like, you're gonna fly this mission because we need you. Well, we'll push back and we'll be like, there's a good chance if we fly during the daytime that we're gonna get shot down. Like, I hope you're cool with that. And they sometimes just force on, like you're gonna be flying during the day. Yeah, they tried to get us to fly daytime when I was in Kuwait. And ISIS at this time still had 56 millimeter anti-aircraft artillery and like man pads and stuff that they had gotten. Afghanistan wasn't so bad. We flew daytime missions there because the Taliban had 23 millimeter anti-aircraft, which really couldn't hit us in our orbit unless they put it on top of a mountain, which they did sometimes to try to trap us in a valley. I mean, it never worked for them, but they tried. All the time through training, they were telling us, hey, you know, you know you're going to kill people, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm here for in this job. It was repeated, like, multiple times. Hey, you're going to kill people. Hey, you're going to kill people. Hey, you're going to kill people. And then got shipped out to my first trip to Afghanistan in 2011, 2012 time frame. When you first start out and then get you to your main base, you actually live in dorms, right? I literally thought my dorm was cursed, but I realized we were just all gunship guys. The guy that uh, I took his room, he had a stroke. 23-year-old had a stroke, the guy I took the room from. Uh, the guy across from me, he ended up getting near constant headaches to the point of like, he couldn't function. Uh, a guy down the hall started getting like epileptic seizures. And the other guy at the end of the hall, he shook. He literally got something where he had like the shakes all the time, like Parkinson's. And I'm like the only one out of that specific time frame of guys that didn't have some neurological disorder happen to him. When you're young, you have a little bit of an immortal, a mortality complex. So like, I didn't expect anything to happen to me. I'm like, well, obviously they had health problems, whatever. There was a point when I was in gunships where I was like, you know, I'm probably gonna die of like cancer. And that's cool. Oh, uh, that's pretty metal. <laughs> I stepped off in Kandahar, had like that oh shit moment. I'm in a fucking combat zone. Mm-hmm. Increased adrenaline, the tunnel vision's coming in because I'm like, <sighs> that whole first night I walked around in like a daze. There was one time where we got rocket attack every 30 minutes. The Taliban had set up on this ridge outside of Kandahar, all these little mortars and rockets and stuff. They'd used ice as a timer they had figured out how to put enough ice in there that when it would melt it would be 30 minutes when the the primer would strike on the projectile and then it would go off so they just knew how much ice to put in there they did that one night where it was just like boom rocket 30 minutes would go by and like all the people would scurry around base looking for a uxo or what the impact site of the the rocket was once they found it or they didn't find it they would give the all clear and they had perfectly timed it because it took us about 30 minutes to like do a full base wide sweep for projectiles 
as soon as we gave it all clear, the next rocket would go off. It freaked me out, like I'm not gonna lie. Okay, there's probably like a rocket coming in. I'll just run out to the bunker. The other gunship guys, they laughed at me. Why are you freaking out? They, they laughed at me basically because I was like doing what I was supposed to do to go to bunker. Their threat tolerance was way off the fucking charts. They just didn't give a shit in most regards. There was a time we were at Chow Hall and we had an incoming rocket. The whole entire like Chow Hall drops to the floor except the gunship guys just sit there at their table just eating their mashed potatoes or whatever the fuck. Combat pay was prorated for like hostile fire stuff. And you could pay more for getting shot at. As it went on, it's like score, they shot at us. So was there a lot of talk there about the politics of it back home? There was there were guys that wanted to talk the politics about it. At that time I was kinda young and I was I was kinda disinterested. We would talk about like how we funded the Taliban to fight Russia. It was kind of karma that we would have to fight the enemy we created kind of thing. So uh, let me set this up. I don't know if they were a QRF, a quick response force, but they were all like a convoy and they were driving up the side of this mountain. There's a sheer drop off like right here to the valley below. Above it, there's like this cresting ridge. We're below the Alpine level. So there's trees up here too. The convoy is going and an RPG hits the, the lead vehicle in like the tire well. The tire explodes, but like everyone inside uh, inside of it's fine. They're meant to withstand explosions. So like these guys dismount from this convoy and they're just shooting up the ridge line. It all happened really quick. I was like on the 105. You think like these shells are pretty dumb. They just explode on impact, right? The PG-45 actually had a radar in it. And when you shot it, these two little like cylinders in there would match up and it would basically form a battery that would start powering this radar and it would start sending out pings 15 feet above ground. It would explode. It would send out like this umbrella shrapnel that was like 0.22 caliber size, approximately 14,000 pieces of it. Well, <laughs> that was what it was supposed to do. What it actually did was it failed. The radar failed. I don't know if like it was just fall or if it sat in inventory too long. So this thing smacks straight into the middle of the tree and just rips it apart. And the tree falls over and it crushes two insurgents that were right below it, taking shelter and firing from it. My first death was by tree. I killed a tree and then two people under it. I went to my room and I was like, I was ready to process. I put some music on and I just like laid there and I was, I was waiting for, I don't know, some kind of hum, human emotion. Cause you know, you, you watch Hollywood movies where like someone kills someone like for the first time and they're like, they're like shook up about it. I was sitting there and on my bed listening to these, these, this music and I was just like, is it weird that I don't feel anything? What's going on here? I should feel some kind of way about what just happened, but like, I don't. And I think over the years I've come to realize like what it was, I was like, told you're going to kill people you're going to kill people you're going to pe kill people i had already had like internalized that message and like accepted that that was going to be the conclusion that's what i was going to do do you ever think just like as you're going about your civilian life back to lives you've taken there was a, a mission in the hellman river valley on that same trip and if i'm going to tell this story i want to tell it in its entirety. The Helmand River Valley was always kind of like a hot spot. Obama had like authorized this general for like a troop surge, one final push in Afghanistan. But because the war was ending, they had started tightening up the rules of engagement, making it harder to you know, sh shoot enemies, but also like specific targets for like near impossible. You couldn't shoot a building without direct authorization from like the guy in charge of all of Afghanistan. I had been flying these Helmand River Valley missions for like five days in a row. And I wasn't expecting anything to happen because nothing had happened the five days previously. This ground party of Marines with their JTAC, they pushed down this little dirt road. This whole town that they were going into was kind of like sunken below the typical uh, elevation of like the, the surrounding area. At the end of the road, there was like a wadi, like a creek. And on the side, they had like a little bit of the wall of the, uh, like this town. As soon as like the first guy crossed that wall into the town, he started getting up, lit up by this two-story mud brick building from like the top window. There was nowhere for these guys to go. Rules of engagement at the time was like, if they could get out of there, don't engage the enemy, just like let sleeping dogs lie, whatever. They went up to the right, they'd go up that embankment and their backs would be to this guy who was shooting at them. If they went back up, up the road, they would lose the cover of the wall because they'd basically walk up above it. And if they went into the creek, there was no guarantee that there wasn't a window on the other side of this two-story that could just shoot them while they were crossing this creek. These guys were just stuck here behind this this mud brick wall with these AKs. It was basically turning this wall into Swiss cheese while they were behind it, losing their cover. I'll never... Oh, God, this mission's hard to talk about. Um, it's the only time I've heard a uh, joint task air controller, like, lose his cool over the radio. 
he called up and he was just like, if you don't get rounds down right now, we're going to die. And it's like, and I'm not doing justice to how it sounded because there was like a crack in his voice and it was real like, you could hear like the the sheer panic in this dude's uh, voice. It was just the crack of it and everything. I had to sit there and watch because like these guys were in a building and we're not allowed to shoot buildings. We tried to tell the, the, the ground force commander like, hey, these guys are taking accurate fire. They can't retreat. We need to shoot this building. And he's like, I'm not giving you my authorization to strike that building. If there's civilians in there, that's on my head. We had an internal discussion on the crew. Like we could declare self-defense for these guys, but if there's any civilians in there, we weren't willing to really accept that risk to put that on our own heads. We had to get in touch with headquarters back in, in Bagram and tell them what was going on. And then those guys had to send a runner to get the literal commander of all the forces in Afghanistan of NATO then they had to bring him up to speed on what was happening, answer all his questions, and then get the authorization authorization from him to strike the building. The entire time, I'm like, I'm fuming. We have the capability to stop what we're watching right now, and we're not using it. That's what our our mission was. Our purpose is to save ground parties' lives. I was seeing red. Like, it's the most mad I've ever been in my life. Going through that experience, I actually know that there's a difference between, like, anger and, like, wrath. That's what I was feeling. Like, I felt like I could just rip out the side of the fuselage of the gunship, jump down out of the sky and, like, fucking sucker punch these Taliban in the face. That's how mad I was that I would do something irrational like that. And uh, so we eventually got the authorization to strike this building. Not two rounds into the 105 and, like, a couple 40s out of the 40 millimeter, we get this ceasefire call. And I'm like, the fuck are we doing? Let's level that bitch, turn it into a fucking dirt parking lot. Then they come over and they're like... Uh, women and children are, are squirting from the building. Where squirting just means run away. At that moment, I was like, what? No, 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 no. There's terrorists in there. There's no women and children. What the fuck? What? What? Couldn't process it. And I don't know, man. I, I've, I've thought about that like multiple times over like the course of my life. It's like, what could we have done to like prevent that? That was a perfect ambush on their part from the setup to like where they got trapped behind the wall. I think about it and I'm like, the only thing that could have stopped it is if like we didn't get that push, we didn't get that surge, or the ore ended earlier. That was that was like I don't know, that was a box that we got stuck into. And I, I guess I came back from that trip. Well, not I guess. I came back from that trip pretty pretty messed up mentally. I had I'd had I had had this civilian casualty mission. And I knew it was bad because they had to bring in medical evacuation helicopters to like take them out. But I never wanted to know how many there were. It was kind of like a spiral at first. Like the entire time I was deployed, it wasn't affecting me mentally because I had like a mission to direct all my mental attention. But when I came back and they, after my family had visited me and left, it was like the first time I'd been alone with my thoughts about that mission. And I thought about it and I was like, okay, that's natural. Like it was pretty fucked up. At this point, I'd already kind of like thought, oh, I guess I just don't feel remorse. But truly what the, the real thing was is like, I was like repressing it all. This mission kind of like built up so much pressure. I couldn't uncork it on my own. I was like, if I can't stop thinking about it, obviously something's wrong about it. I was hesitating at that point to like throw around like the PTSD word. I didn't want to admit that I could have something messed up mentally with myself. Um, I was like, all right, so we're going to do this my way. And I went out and I bought like a fifth of a uh, crown and I went home and I fucking uncorked it because I knew it was a depressant and I was going to drink it, tap into those feelings, like release the pressure on the dam and just like whatever. Well, that was a bad move because as soon as I unbottled those repressed emotions, basically bawled like a like a baby for like four hours that night. <laughs> uh, and uh, it didn't really stop after that. I thought like I'd wake up the next morning and oh, cool. I had a, like a good cry it's out of my system immediately afterwards okay i'm thinking about the mission but i'm thinking about the mission because i'm thinking about how i uncorked that emotion and then it was like okay stop thinking about the mission stop stop thinking about it it just bounced around in my head all day for like months it was bringing me to like my breaking point easier for me to admit now than it was then because like i was very prideful admitting that i have a mental problem was like never a place i was gonna go it got pretty dark there for a while. I couldn't even like decompress. What I had done before in my free time was like watch movies and, and play video games. And like I would watch a movie and like think about that mission because there'd be like some small scene that would remind me of like what had happened in the Hellman River Valley. Or I'd play a video game and it'd be violent. And I would think about 
you know, what happened there. <laughs> Everything led back to that mission. I couldn't, I couldn't go to like mental health or anything because then I wouldn't be able to fly. They would take me off flying orders to deal with that. It felt like I would be letting down uh, the rest of the gunship community or I'd be letting down the ground parties deployed. And I realize now that like the Air Force would have always filled my slot, but at the time, like I felt like I owed it to like the taxpayer, to the ground party, to my to my fellow gunners and the the gunship community as a whole for you know, I just I felt like I owed everyone without like feeling like I owed myself anything. I was drinking to feel sad and to not think about it. At least when I was drinking like I could, I felt like I was in control, which really was the dumbest thing to think when I was like going through this because I wasn't in control of it at all. And drinking was not helping at all. It didn't matter. I was just doing it anyways. Like I, I did initially try to drink with other people, but I realized that I wanted to fight other people I drank around, which is a new thing. I drank before that and I was always happy drunk, but like after. After this, when I drank, I wanted to fight my friends, special forces guys that I ran into at like the bar. Uh, and I realized that like, I don't want to fight my friends and like the other people that I work with. I just kind of withdrew from that party drinking because it wasn't partying anymore for me.